there's a lot going on in the news, and we are not going to talk about any of it. We're going to talk about a more important question. Should conservatives accept and embrace gay marriage? Do conservatives need to embrace gay marriage to survive? We will speak to YouTube star and the author of Made for Love, Same-Sex Attractions and the Catholic Church, Father Michael Schmitz. We will discuss what has become one of the central preoccupations of our age, even though it only affects a relatively small number of Americans. We will discuss a whole range of subjects with, re uh, with regard to sexual morality and the question of same-sex marriage and decide once and for all what the GOP and conservatives should do. I am Michael Knowles and this is the Michael Knowles Show. In 2001, Americans opposed uh, monogamous same-sex unions, uh, opposed including those in the definition of marriage by a margin of 57% to 35%. By 2017, those numbers had more than flipped to 62% supporting same-sex marriage and 32% opposing it. 56% of baby boomers support same-sex marriage. I think around 150 million percent of millennials support it. Even 41% of the greatest generation, the silent generation, support same-sex marriage. The leading demographics supporting same-sex marriage are the religiously unaffiliated, the so-called nuns, who support same-sex marriage at a rate of a shocking 85%. Two-thirds of mainline Protestants now support same-sex marriage, but those guys will believe anything. You know, they're wrong on a number of things. Uh, mainline Protestantism is basically just a country club, I think, at this point. Uh, leading the opposition to same-sex marriage are white evangelical Protestants, with only 35% of them approving it, though that number did rise 8 percentage points from 27% in just one year. Incredibly, two-thirds of Catholics whose pontiff calls gay marriage, quote, a machination of the father of lies who seeks to deceive and confuse the children of God, support same-sex marriage. 73% of Democrats and 70% of independents support it, while even 40% of Republicans support same-sex marriage, nearly doubling over the past decade. In 2001, one-third of both blacks and whites supported same-sex marriage. Today, two-thirds of whites and half of black Americans support it. Women are more likely than men to support same-sex marriage, though both the numbers, uh, they're, they're high for both, 64% for women and 60% for men. Sweet little Elisa is indicative of this gender divide. She has been encouraging me to get a gay marriage for years so that she can finally get away and be free. Understandable. How do we explain this marriage shift on the question of same-sex marriage? To help us answer that, we are joined by Father Michael Schmitz. And before we get to Father Schmitz, who has a wonderful new book out and a lot to say, I have got to talk to you about a very important thing that keeps our lights on. Uh, this is ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, let me tell you something. We have learned this the hard way at the Daily Wire. The way that we hire people is that we go to the sidewalk in front of the insane asylum and we pick out the craziest looking person there is and we give him either a job as a COO or a producer or an executive producer. This isn't, it turns out, the best way to hire people. What you should do is go to Zip Recruiter. Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online and just praying for the right people to see it. That only works if you're friends with Father Schmidt. If you're not, if you're just a run-of-the-mill company, you gotta, you gotta look for something else too. Uh, ZipRecruiter knew that there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. Uh, ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and it invites them to apply for the job. So a lot of job boards, you just post your a job and it goes out into the ether and nobody ever sees it and that's it and they say they've given you a service. ZipRecruiter finds the people for you and notifies them. This is a really important step. Uh, th these inv uh, invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. And right now, I know you always want free things, don't you people? Well, that's fine. My listeners can try ZipRecruiter absolutely free. That is right, absolutely free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MKS. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash MKS. What is it, Marshall? ZipRecruiter.com slash MKS. Slash MKS. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. All right. And they keep the lights on. That's the best thing about those guys. It's a great service, but they help. Keep, come on, man. Support them. Okay. We're joined by Father Michael Schmitz. Father Schmitz, thank you so much for being here. 
Thanks, Michael. I right off the bat, I have to apologize that I do not have my hot or cold <laughs> leftist tears mug. I just have a DC Comics. I'm sorry. That right you know, gate, I, I'm sorry for you. Uh, it's okay. Obviously, uh, you know, you can probably enjoy them in just about any vessel. They are always delicious. But this is the only one that's <laughs> FDA approved to maintain those leftist tears, hot or cold, always salty and delicious. So we'll have to get one out to you right now in the. It just to protect your health, protect the rectory from yeah. the fallout. Absolutely, right. Uh, you, don't, you don't want you don't want them to go to go bad. That's you right. Those, you never. Oh, bad. they never go bad. They are all. Oh, they stay great forever and ever. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know Father Schmitz, he has a great YouTube channel. I I think it is fair to say, Father Schmitz, you are the most prominent YouTube star among the Catholic clergy. You're at least up there. I don't know. Bishop Barron is pretty big. Bishop Barron is big. Father Rutler has some great videos online, uh, yeah. but. Father Schmidt's channel, uh, Ascension Presents, has been viewed by over 11 million viewers. He has a new book out from Ignatius, Made for Love, Same-Sex Attraction, and the Catholic Church. So, Father Schmitz, to begin, there are examples, we are always told, in classical antiquity of same-sex unions and even unions that resemble marriage. Uh, the Roman Emperor Nero apparently sort of married a young boy, Sporus, after the death of his first two wives. He made his boy bride dress up like a lady at public events, so Wikipedia tells me. Now, of course, Nero did it is not exactly an endorsement. For the right, history he also of, married a horse. Yeah, so. <laughs> right, right. There's that. That, yeah, there, there were a lot of uh, strange activities that were going on, uh, not exactly a, a guidepost. Uh, for the history of the Christian West, marriage has had a clear meaning, the union of man and woman. Uh, this has been the consensus in the West for millennia. And now we think it's the opposite. Now that that public opinion has switched so quickly, what has caused it to flip within just a few years? Well, I think there's a number of factors. Uh, you don't even have to. I don't. I don't think you even have to ap appeal to any kind of like religious idea. I think you just once we disconnect from um, a real sense of, uh, I guess, rationality. Once we disconnect from reason, and once we actually, I think, I think in some ways, embrace a scientific, not scientific. Scientific is great. Scientific worldview where we can just where the world is like endlessly manipulative or manipulative a bull um, that we can basically uh, redefine everything. So. It's basically um, it comes from a thing called, like you might call it nominalism, where if you uh, name a thing that thing, then it just becomes that thing. But there's no such thing as a true nature of a thing, right? So that now I just used the word thing a thousand times in the last two sentences. But I always ask people, okay, if you want to redefine marriage, first, just define it. And, and blank. Blank, blank uh, spaces, blank stares back. Because it's like, well, it's, it's uh, when you really love someone. Well, okay, that's a good question, or that's a good point. I really love my uh, brother, my my sister. Is, is that marriage? Like, no, 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 it's when you love someone and, you, and you're committed to them. Like, okay, well, um, uh, what if I uh, love my, my nephew and I'm really committed to him and just want to see him do well? He's my godson, I want to see him do well. Is that the same thing? You know, no, it's when you love someone, you're committed to each other, and you really help each other flourish. Well, right up the road from here, there's a convent of nuns, and they love each other, they're committed, and they help each other flourish. Is that marriage? So, like, I think before we even, I mean, it just, it's, it's basically anti-reason mm -hmm. to try to redefine something that you don't know the definition I of know in the first place. That is such a good point. I noticed that they do this, and I think that it is a real strategy of the left. I think it's well thought out, because I actually see Donald Trump using it very effectively on other issues. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump says, we are going to build the wall, and Mexico is going to pay for it. And so we all start arguing about who's going to pay for the wall. Is it going to be Mexico? Is it going to be the taxpayers? And he's gotten us to slide right past his premise, which is the actually contentious question, are we going to build the wall? It's the same thing with marriage. The the left seems to have blown right past the debate over what marriage is and the definition of it into who has the right to get married. So now we're arguing over civil rights. And of course, if it's a question of civil rights, everybody is going to get that right. But that first question is, what is marriage? And, and the left is insisting now that it is uh, uh, monogamous same-sex unions, but for some reason not polygamous same-sex unions. Those have been uh, excluded from the new definition of marriage. So the question, on the question of what is marriage, why is it so important that marriage be the union of man and woman? Yeah, I think that um, from the foundation of civilization, you recognize that the essential building block of any community, I mean, from, from the smallest uh, tribe to the, the largest nation, 
the, the building block, the essential building block is marriage and family. Why? Because um, because we have a lot of organizations, right? We have a lot of people who are loosely committed to each other, but in no other relationship do offspring happen. And right. And so that that sense of like, so there's no propagation of the species for human beings, at least outside of this particular kind of relationship. Yeah, you can maybe farm it out to the state. You could give it to the, you know, the whole village to raise the child. But the village doesn't create the child and the village doesn't um, provide a stable environment for that child. The only reason why the state cares about marriage in the first place, like why we have tax benefits, why we have some perks for those who are married, is because we say, okay, it's not because we believe in love so much that we just want to support you kids and make it want, want you to, you know, make it in this crazy world. It's because you two kids are going to probably have more kids. Right. And we want to make sure that those children are taken care of. And so why is it so important? Because we're messing with the, we're really messing in, in a way that, We've never experienced before, I think, as a species with this um, undefinition. I, I wouldn't even say it's a redefinition of marriage. It's an undefinition of the most essential building block of a society. And so then you think about this. What happens if you try to build with materials that have never been tested before? They, you wouldn't. You wouldn't build any, any structure that, that was solid. You wouldn't be able to build any structure that you could rely on because you don't even know if the materials are going to work. And I think this is a really, this is a really dangerous experiment that we're in the middle of here in, a, in our culture. And they say, so often uh, I find this to be the case on essential f uh, first principles sort of political issues. I think that I understand the left's point of view, but I don't think that they understand our point of view. And very frequently they say, uh, they mock people on the right or the religious right, and they say, they say that we say, you know, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and they right, refer right. to Genesis as some children's fable that is, has no meaning. Meanwhile, Genesis is perhaps the most profound text ever composed by human <laughs> hands. Uh, now, what they say is that in a, if children are this central aspect, the ability. The, the potential to create children, which is not to say that a couple who is infertile, uh, you know, a woman who has difficulty right. conceiving or whatever, doesn't mean to exclude them from it, but excluding even the possibility, the logical poss possibility. Uh, we now have, for instance, uh, single parents who are able to adopt. And we now, so in that case, the question of children seems to be a, a little tangential. We know that a gay people, people with same-sex attraction, can adopt as, as though they are single. So now, if they are in a same-sex union, certainly they could continue to adopt. They say, well, marriage has been so undefined already. They say, for instance, that divorce has skyrocketed in modern years, although the rate has actually come down recently. What, how do you respond to people who say marriage has already been undefined? Who cares if we add a little bit more to that? Right. Well, I think that it's kind of like a, well, I guess the Titanic is already sinking. And so we might as well just, you know, play our instruments and go down with the ship. Right. Shoot some uh, holes in the side of it. Exactly. I mean, look, the iceberg did that. So why don't I just, you know, um, jump overboard and, and right into the ocean? I, I would say that I think there's something worth salvaging. And I would not deny the fact that um, like heterosexual marriages falling apart or people, you know, kind of having no fault divorce that at, you know, when that was proposed, we probably as uh, as people who care about our country, people who care about our culture, we probably should have been a little bit more wary and a little bit more uh, mm. uh, cautious in moving forward with that. And could, because we now we Second see the fallout. We, we see how, how this really has affected mm. um, children at being raised uh, by in. I mean, even though children can say, I love both of my parents in them getting divorced. That's good that they love them still, but they're they're but they've been affected by this. Mm. And so right. to say, like, we should have. We should have been stronger. Why not now say, let's get stronger rather than let's just keep being weak. So I think, yes, there's a sense of like, let's define this rather than undefine it. And let's actually help uh, like marriages become better, not just say you can't have this to, you know, a, a gay couple or a lesbian couple. I think it's really important. And I don't see it with people who are in my generation. I don't think that they have the in for a penny, in for a pound attitude. I notice that all of my friends, uh, everyone in our generation, our parents were divorced. It was, it just happened to our parents' generation. And I, I notice now people are much more careful about marriage <laughs> and they, they seem yeah. to be, obviously the plural of anecdote isn't data, but we do know the trends are declining, the divorce rates. And I, just talking to friends of mine, regardless of their political views, they'll say, yeah, I really don't want to get divorced. 
divorced. I'm really trying not to get divorced. I think that wasn't a good experience and I, I don't want to do it myself. Uh, I'd like to ask you a bit about the theology of the body. And by the way, guys, this right. is where things are going to get real saucy. But before we get to the theology of the body, we have to talk about a much more important thing than, than all of these essential moral questions. We have to talk about toothbrushes. We have to talk about quip. This is important. Just as we keep our moral lives clean and our, you know, we keep our, our ethical systems clean, so too must we clean our teeth. And <laughs> quip is the new electric toothbrush that packs just the right amount of vibrations into a slimmer design at a fraction of the cost of bulkier traditional electric brushes. Now, I I will say this. This is a, a little bit of an admission. I, I didn't go to the dentist for probably five or seven years I, because I'm a man. And so I don't think about these things. I don't care. I don't make doctor's appointments. I also didn't go see the doctor for a long time. Then I got engaged and sweet little Elisa just took over my life and made all of these appointments for me and said, if we're getting married, you're getting checked out, pal. And it, so I go to the dentist and he excoriated me for several minutes over not using an electric toothbrush. Apparently this is a new invention and they, they made it for a reason. It's much more effective than using regular, I don't know, I usually brush with a stick or something and pull a branch off a tree outside of my window. An electric toothbrush is much better because it just gives you all of those vibrations and brushes much faster faster than you possibly could with your own hand. So the guiding pulses alert you when to switch sides on Quip. It uh, makes the brushing uh, the right amount of time effortless. Quip also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and unsticks to use as a cover for hygienic travel anywhere. I have it just right on my mirror right now. So it can go in your gym gag or your carry-on, and you don't need to be disgusting like me and just throw it in whatever, the back of your car or whatever. Uh, because the thing that cleans your mouth should also be clean, Quip's subscription plan refreshes your brush on a dentist's recommended schedule, delivering new brush heads every three months for just $5. This is the other thing. I know it sounds like I'm just talking to the guys, but it's because we're so lazy about these things. I, If I were not told to do it, I would not replace my toothbrush more than once every 15 to 18 years. I just wouldn't do it. I don't, it would be all mangled and all the little bristles are coming out or probably new bristles are growing on the other side of it. You need to replace your toothbrush. It's very important. It will, uh, it'll just make your teeth smile, especially look these days with new media, everybody can be a star and you can go on YouTube. So make sure you got to have those pearly whites. This is the moneymaker, baby. Don't cheap out on yourself. So, uh, most toothbrushes don't get named one of time magazine's best inventions of the year, but quip did find out for yourself why it's backed by a network of over 10,000 dental professionals, including dentists, hygienists, dental students, and people who have teeth like me. I also think it's a great product. It starts at just $25. And if you go to quip, I'm sorry, if you go to getquip.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, just like Jay-Z's wife, uh, right now you will get your first refill pack free with a quip electric toothbrush. And that is a great thing. That uh, is your first refill pack is free at getquip.com dot com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. That is G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Knowles. What's the URL, Marshall? Getquip.com slash Knowles. Getquip.com slash Knowles. Okay. Now that we've, we've talked about our teeth, it's time to get into the theology of the body. And, and the theology of the body tells us something about our mouth, too. The theology of the body tells us that just as our mouths have a purpose to eat food and our eyes have a purpose, uh, so too do our sexual organs have a purpose. And in spite of the bizarre things that each and every one of us wants to do to some degree with those organs, uh, we should use them in accordance with that purpose. But uh, m my question, Father, is should we... Uh, use them only in accordance with that purpose. So my mouth is for eating, but I also use it to smoke cigars, uh, as did Popes Pius X and Pius XI. Even a, even a saint did this. Pope St. John XXIII also smoked. Uh, similarly, the central unit of human life is the union of husband and wife. It's an image of Christ and his church, the bridegroom and the bride. But can other arrangements ever be permissible or is tobacco different because the body is a temple and the temple needs incense uh, rather than the imaginative uses of the sexual organs that we uh, talk about so frequently in our culture today? Great, great question. And actually, I think that uh, also I love the, uh, the incense idea in the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's good. I haven't heard that one yet. This, I I've think, is my only contribution to theology. I think that's the lone, <laughs> the lone bit. I have some students who have asked me to bless their cigarettes so they could have holy smokes. And I'm like, I don't know, dude. I don't know. Maybe um, in a papal conclave you, you could use it. I don't know. Just, well, because it's white smoke, I guess, you know, going up. Um, 
you know, it's funny because I did a debate with a man. Um, he teaches theology, and uh, we were debating same-sex marriage. Um, and in the course of the debate, he said something that was really profound. It just stopped me. Um, he said, um, well, I'm not defined by my biology. And I remember just thinking, like, oh, wow. Like, I must have this look on my face that the moderator of the debate recognized that I don't have a very good poker face. I was like, wow, this is – she said, Father Schmitz, do you have something to say? And I said, yeah, I, I realized – we're not just right here in this uh, in this moment. We weren't talking just about um, uh, marriage. We weren't talking about sexual morality. We weren't even talking about morality. Mm. What we what it all came down to was a worldview, and the worldview is either Gnosticism or it's uh, basically uh, a enfleshed materialism or uh, ensouled materialism. And what I mean by that is, like, so the Gnostics would uh, or Manichees would say that. Uh, the, the body's bad. The body's not you. Mm-hmm. You are truly your soul. Whereas as Christians in the Christian worldview, we'd say no body and soul together. And so like it was it was remarkable that this person was was admitting that that because uh, they're a theology teacher at a Catholic school. They're saying, like, no, no, I'm basically I'm Gnostic. I'm not my body. I'm not my body. I'm just my spirit or something. Yeah, my spirit, my soul, my psyche, whatever. Um, and that's a really profound shift in this world, because I think if we're going to have a debate uh, about any morality issues, any sexuality issues, sexuality issues, or any just like uh, issues that pertain to what we do with our bodies, it's all going to come down to, well, the question, are you your body or not? Is mm-hmm. your body just a shell? Is it just a case? Is it just that the true you is some kind of uh, ephemeral and n- disconnected from your body? So you mentioned theology of the body, which is a term that was it came out of John Paul II's pontificate, his teaching. Um, and in, in that, he said, the body and it alone is capable of making visible the invisible, the spiritual and the divine. Because if you think about this, we've never, we've never learned anything outside of our body. We've never, we've, we've, we, 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 everything you and I have learned has been through our body, like through our eyes. We read something or saw something through our ears. We heard something. We felt something. Um, we've never expressed love except in and through our bodies. We've never expressed disgust in and except in and through our bodies. So this reality is, we've never known anyone without a body. Mm. And yet there's this kind of worldview that says, but no, no, but, but what I do with my body doesn't really matter because it doesn't touch my soul. And so that's, that's truly ultimately what it comes down to is again, Gnosticism or, or Manichaeism. And so our starting point has to be, okay, are you your body and soul together or not? Because if you're not, then we're going to have to figure another way to talk about these things. If you are, then I think we can address the question you, you brought up, which is a really good question, which right. is, um, do things have a nature? And is that nature fixed or is that nature determined by how we want to use it? And so um, I, I, what I would say is I always like to have the ask the question. Uh, we get the idea of a, a thing's nature, the what it isness of a thing by asking the question, what is it for? Right. So so we, we know what a chair is because we, we know the what it's forness of a chair it's to sit on. And we, we have the what it isness of a table when we ask the what it's for in it, okay, to set things on. Right. What and the so what, realize, the okay, what it isness of the Michael Knowles show is to spread kofefe, to spread kofefe galore to all <laughs> of the world, of course. <laughs> yes. And so now you know what it's for in it, and now you know the nature. And so the question is, can I uh, take something that the what it's for in it and use it to my own end? And the answer, of course, is yes, right? So I can take the chair I'm sitting on, and I can set something on it. And I'm not violating the nature or the what it's forness of the chair. Mm. And I could on this this solid table I've got, I could sit on it, and I'm not violating the what it's forness to set things on of the table. But there are some things we can do that actually do violate the what it's forness. For example, I couldn't um, take this chair I'm sitting on and like put a tree trunk and like split wood on it. I'd pretty quickly violate the nature of the chair. And same thing is true when it comes to our bodies. If the premise we are our bodies then um, there's what is, what is forness. So let's look at the sexual act. Um, if you had a scientist who asked the question, what it's for, what is it for? You'd see at least two things. And the two primary things that are there at every, every sexual act. Um, there's uh, procreation, that's what it's for. And bonding of the couple, that's what it's for. Mm-hmm. And we can see this on a biological level, both of the things on the biological level, we're not even talking about religion at this point. We're saying that no, there are, there are bonding hormones that get released when people enter into the sexual embrace. So that's what it's for in it. Yeah, it's for bonding. And also it's the only action we know of that's oriented towards making new life. So what it's for in it is procreation. So does that mean that every single act 
has to be to have a child or every single act has to be for bonding. Well, we recognize that. I'm sure that, you know, you might know couples like who do like who have been in the situation where they're trying to conceive. Mm -hmm. And so they might say, okay, so she's like, I'm ovulating right now. Let's go. That might not be specifically for bonding. It's not the most romantic way to start an encounter, certainly. Hey, it's the clock's running, buddy. (laughs) Clock's ticking, buddy. Let's go. Get in there. You got it. Um, But not for bonding, but they're not violating bonding, right? And by doing this, because they're both entering into this, as as we imagine a husband and wife, or you'd have a couple that, you know, they're not in not specifically intending to have a child come out of this, but they're not working against this. They just simply are, we want to express our love for one another, but they're not working against uh, the openness to life. Mm-hmm. In those cases, they, they'd be using this for a certain purpose, but not using it contrary to its nature. And that's the, that's the big question. Uh, because we, what, we rec- what we recognize is if I use a thing against its nature or try to work against the nature or the what it's foreness of a thing, that's when things begin to break down. This is, so, the, this is the very difficult... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, yeah, I've used my own purpose, but if I, I can't extend that out to any purpose mm-hmm. and not expect the, thing, the nature to break down. This is, that, that's a wonderful explanation. And this, this aspect, the unitive aspect, I think is what's so difficult in a culture that is obsessed with the erotic. So the, the Christian answer to same-sex attraction, as you explain in the book, is celibacy. And chastity, to which we're all called, but for uh, people with same-sex attractions, that obviously results in celibacy. Uh, of, of course, that answer is easier said than done. We're all called to be chaste, but as, as a former Manichaean uh, who became a great saint, St. <laughs> saint Augustine said, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Uh, but doesn't, not yet. D- doesn't the call for people who are exclusively attracted to members of the same sex exclude them from erotic love, one of the, one of the great consolations of life, so I'm told? Uh, is that burden not too immense in a sex-obsessed culture such as ours that places so high a value on the erotic? That's a great question because, and I love how you phrased it, because uh, we frame it in a, in a, in a sex-obsessed culture. And so what makes things more difficult, I think, is the fact that, um, that we've reduced everything, like all the great, so John Paul II, again, this theology of the body, he said, he said, man cannot live without love. Without love, man remains a being incomprehensible to himself. He's a mystery to himself if he doesn't experience love. Now, we hear that, we think that is the Pope talking about, because what we've taken is this big concept of love, and we've reduced it to romantic love. Then mm-hmm. we've taken this concept of romantic love and reduced it to sex. So what it sounds like the Pope is saying is, man cannot live without sex. <laughs> without sex, he remains a being incomprehensible to himself. His life is senseless unless he has sex. And yet, the great minds and the great hearts, the great lives of history have said, yeah, eros, you know, romantic love or erotic love is a good. And we would, as Catholic Christians, we would say, exactly, it's a, it's a good. But it's not even the greatest love. Because right. um, I love, I really like C.S. Lewis. He's one of my, one of my guys. He's, and, I, uh, I believe uh, Tolkien referred to him as his heretic friend. And he is, I do love C.S. <laughs> Lewis. I, I love the man. I, I devour him regularly. Seriously. So in the four loves, he talks about these four kinds of love. Eros, is always storge, which is your, your affection. Um, eros, which is the romantic love. And then he says, but there's philia. And philia is not just storge, like buddiness, um, but is true friendship. And he, and he, he says, he, he maintains, and makes a great case for it, that philia is even more, uh, more rare, uh, therefore more precious, and even more life-giving than eros, which is why probably I'm, I imagine that you're as you're preparing to get married, uh, that you'd be saying, like, I'm not just, I'm not just in love with her. She's also my best friend. This is, you hear this all the time. I'm marrying my best friend. And I always, whenever my fiance says this, I always try to temper this because I agree with you. I say, you know, friendship is so rare these days. And I'm, I'm blessed to have a number of friendships that I think rise to this level of great friendship, of, of true friendship, not just, you know, seeing your buddies and, catching a baseball game or something, but real friendship, standing alongside one another and looking at the same thing. And so when, but one of which does include my fiance, but I always say, well, you know, you're not my best, I don't best buddy. What are we (laughs) going to go to the bar together? I don't know. Um, But that that is female friend. That's right. Yes. She is certainly my best female friend. And, but you hear this so much. And I, it seems to me when people say I'm marrying my best friend, they are aspiring to this, this sort of friendship, this philia that has been lost, that, that uh, ancient cultures and even really just the pre-modern 
recognized and spoke so highly of. And, and that really seems to be lacking because all our culture wants to talk about are saucier things than that. Absolutely. And so, and so in that culture, right, where, where true friendship is like, well, I guess it's a consolation. It's a consolation prize. Like maybe you have a true friend, but, but what you really want is a lover. Yes, it is more difficult. But I would say that, I mean, there's a number of ministries. Um, there's even a, a group in the Catholic Church called Courage. Mm -hmm. And Courage is men and women who experience same-sex attraction. We're saying, but, but we know the call of Jesus. We know the call to be chaste, and that it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And I know, I mean, dozens and dozens, just personally, and hundreds and hundreds that I uh, have encountered, um, who are living really healthy, holy, rich lives because experiencing same-sex attraction is not a death sentence. Like, I think sometimes people think that that's the case if you're going to be Catholic or if you're going to be Christian, that it's like, yeah, well, it's too bad to be you, man. This is going to You're going to have a terrible like, life. It's never, yeah. It, it's, it's going to be something that's going to be difficult, but every one of us has something difficult that we have to deal with, that we're going to wrestle with our entire lives, that sometimes is, is opens up doors for us and opportunities, and sometimes it just it, it makes life really difficult. But like the people that I've encountered who have uh, same sex attraction, who also are saying, but no, I, I'm called to be chaste. And so I know what that means, mm. um, are living really, really full lives with true friendship. And um, that's not something I mean, I think if, if, if most people knew what true friendship really was or really is, they would they would say, oh, wow, that that's a blessed life, not a not a cursed life. Mm hmm. That's, that's interesting. That is one of the jokes sometimes you hear among guys who like to go to the cigar bar and have some whiskeys and smoke cigars. You say, well, without the erotic component, being gay wouldn't be so bad. Uh, you know, there's something, the erotic component doesn't sound great, but uh, other than that, it's a pretty, pretty good time. Uh, there is so much more that I'd like to talk about. I'd like to get a little bit more into the, the political aspects of all of this and, uh, and into the uh, question of sexual identity, why the left is so obsessed with uh, making the sexes seem exactly the same in this question of transsexuality, which affects like five people on earth, but which has become the number one political topic we've talked about. But I can't do any of that right now. I can't do any of that because we have got to talk about something very manly. This, I think, is a, a providential ad read that we have speaking of, uh, speaking of the male sex, man crates. Man crates, not only do these guys let us keep the lights on, but they are really good. I think I have two of my man crates products just on me right here because I just got a new man crate. And let me see if I can dig it out. They gave me this, they just gave me this great new lighter, this new butane lighter. I won't light it so I don't torch the whole studio. They just, it came in my new cigar man crate. Let me see if it's in my pocket, never leave home without it. This brand new cigar cutter. And it all came in a uh, an ammo box. So I ordered the new cigar humidor man crate and it came in a, this great ammo box. I said, where's the humidor? I opened it up. The, the ammo box is the humidor. They fitted it out with cedar and uh, hygrometers and uh, cigar booklets that you can write about. I love them. The first one I got was the Whiskey Appreciation set. That came in a gigantic crate with a crowbar. And I got mine gift wrapped because I, lo I love Christmas morning. And it's like whenever you order a man crate, it's just another Christmas morning. So you they duct, uh, duct tape it. That's the gift wrapping. You open that up. You pry this thing open. It took me a, little, it took me a couple tries. It's, it's a little hard. If you go to the help section of their website, it says try harder. Uh, good advice always. Mancrates.com is the only place to find awesome gifts that guys love guaranteed. So listen, Valentine's Day is coming up. Giving your guy a box of chocolates for Valentine's Day, it's pretty boring. I like boxes of chocolates. I eat them frequently. But, you know, we can do that any day of the week. Surprise him with a heart-shaped box of delicious beef jerky. The ultimate snaphrodisiac. Speaking of theology of the body and the erotic, I will say uh, oysters on the half shell are great, but delicious beef jerky is quite a snack for uh, This isn't some cologne sampler or cheesy mug. Man Crates offers curated gift collections for every type of guy, from the sports fanatic to the home chef to the outdoorsman. Uh, you can check out classics like the NFL Barware Crate, the Whiskey Appreciation Crate, I recommend it highly, or fresh takes on Valentine's gifts, including the Salami Bouquet. If my hunt give me a salami bouquet, I would bump up the date of the wedding. I, I would be so, I would cry tears of joy at, all over the salami and make it even saltier. I uh, go to mancrates.com and then wait for that magic moment. 
the man in your life will fall head over heels when his gift arrives and he gets to pry it open uh, with a crowbar. <laughs> there are thousands of five-star reviews. Every gift comes with complete satisfaction guarantee. Go to mancrates.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, for 5% off. They don't off offer this discount anywhere else, except for maybe some of our other shows. Uh, that is 5% off right now at mancrates.com slash Knowles. What is it, Marshall? Mancrates.com slash Knowles. Mancrates.com slash Knowles. And please send me one. I really like it. Send me a salami box or a salami bouquet. It'd be so great. And we have so much more to talk about with Father Schmitz, but you can't do it unless you go to dailywire.com right now. What do you get? You get me, you get the Andrew Clavin Show, you get the Ben Shapiro Show, you get the conversation, which is coming up, folks, and I'm going to be in it so you can ask questions. Everybody can watch. Only members can ask questions. Many are called, but few are chosen. You get all of that. No ads on the website, but most importantly, most importantly for your safety, for the safety of your family, for the integrity of your house, your property, do not let the fallout from radioactive leftist tears affect you. you this is a real important matter here, folks. That you get the leftist tears tumbler where you can store the leftist tears hot or cold. They'll always be salty and delicious. You can use it. It's a very versatile vessel. So make sure you go to dailywire.com. We will be right back with more from Father Schmitz. Okay, on the real political nature of this lobby, I think this lobby that tries to make our culture talk about sex and sexual issues all the time, um, it's, it seems to me that the issue of same-sex marriage is part and parcel of a feminist ideology that ironically seeks to erase all gender difference. So the premise of same-sex marriage seems to be that uh, men and women are exactly the same, that there isn't sexual difference. Because uh, very basically, if M plus W equals M plus M equals W plus W, then M equals W. They're the same thing rather than being uh, complementary. Why does the left want to erase sexual difference? It's a great question. I, you know, like you had said earlier, uh, I can understand the, uh, I often find I, that I feel like, or I believe that I can understand the, the perspective and the ideology or the, 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 the thought process of people who say, I want to advocate for, for same-sex marriage. I want to advocate, advocate for transgenderism. I think I get the argument. Um, but when it comes to this, like, why? When he asks the question, but, but, but why? Then I, I don't. Then at this point, I'm thinking, like, what's the ulterior or ultimate um, end? It, it kind of, it eludes me. Because it seems like the ultimate conclusion is a, a very, very different culture than we have. Um, one that does not, ne does not necessarily flourish, but one that kind of just is everything's up for grabs. And so when it comes to like the, a lot of the motivation of people who would advocate for um, like same-sex marriage or would advocate for uh, like a trans, kind of advocating transgender stuff is it seems like what I, uh, in talking with some high schoolers, asking them about this, the response was like, well, I don't know. I just, I just feel bad that they can't get married. Mm. Oh, well, that's it. And so, and so I think that, that there might be some people who are like kind of the masterminds. I have no idea who that, who they would be, but I think at the, at the core, the reason why the tide has shifted so quickly is because we've abandoned thinking and we've given it all over to feeling, to emotion. And so the reason, quote unquote, reason why, uh, the, the tide has shifted so much is because we've abandoned reason and we're just saying, well, I just, I feel bad. It makes me feel sad to think that someone would feel sad. And, and of course, you know, you, you and I, we don't want to make people unnecessarily sad or want to make, put undue like suffering in their lives. But that's not the same thing as uh, saying, well, but is it so? Like, you know, so here's a person who um, would uh, say, I don't, I'm in a man's body, but I've always felt like a woman. Well, first of all, I have to ask the question, how do you know? Right. Meaning what? like, how do you know what a woman feels like? I, I, I don't, I don't like playing baseball or football. Like, okay, that's, that's a stereotype right there. I, it, I'm not going to serious. I'm not, I'm not going to advocate a stereotype. If you're a man who doesn't uh, embrace a lot of masculine things, like you don't want your man crate or whatever, that's like, that's, well, that's, that's unforgivable. Fine, that I believe is actually an unforgivable not, sin yeah, in the I scripture. I have to I refresh it. Yeah. I, I apologize. But like that sense of like someone, I bet I feel like a woman. How do you know? what a woman feels like. And therefore, all you know is what you feel like, which is I feel disconnected from my body. Now, I, for my part, I, 
I have emotion. I have, I have a compassion for that. And I have, I have pity on that. But, but the answer, I don't think, is to say, oh, in that case, um, you must not be a man. Right. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced or not experienced, but you've encountered uh, this uh, a condition called BIID, which is Body Integrity Identity Disorder. And what BIID is, is a real thing where people will say things like, um, I, this isn't my hand. Mm. I've always felt like this is really part of me. And so they would go in to say the surgeon and say, could you amputate? Why? It's perfectly healthy, but it's, it's not my hand. And now the medical community has universally uh, said, no, don't do that. Because why? Because that is their hand. And the problem is not the hand. The problem is there's a disconnect between their perception right. and reality. Right. But, but when it comes to transgenders and when it comes to sex, it seems like we just forget common sense. And so if, you know, if someone would say, this is my hand, no, 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 that really is. You're just mistaken. Let's help you get to a place where you can uh, make that, like, bring it together. But someone says, these aren't my genitals. You're like, wait, wait. Well, then let's have surgery. Let's get rid of those. Well, we have to get rid of those. That's a different kind of organ. It doesn't seem to make sense. Of course. It doesn't seem to make sense. And 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 this, this, uh, well, this, uh, this issue of transgender does seem to be one where people are suffering. That sounds like a terrible condition, and I, yeah. I certainly feel for people who have it, but they seem to be looking for relief in all of the wrong places. The pioneers at uh, Johns Hopkins who, who be- began the uh, gender mutilation surgery have, have stopped doing it because they realized that the, even the suicide rates of people who suffer from this did not decrease after surgery. So even the operation that uh, everyone expected to give relief to this condition didn't quite uh, do it. And this does seem to be the the real issue because I always uh, fear for when we're talking about this issue, uh, people didn't choose to be born attracted to members of the same sex. I don't think. I don't think anyone ever said, yes, today I'm going to do that. And it, it, that is a really sad condition if one looks at a traditional uh, Christian view of things or a Jewish view of things or uh, any other tr- traditional sexual ethic, and they say, I'm excluded from this. And I, it, I really wish I weren't excluded from uh, from erotic love or from pursuing my sexual desires. And I, I think a lot of the time, uh, Christians uh, and the Catholic Church in particular are called haters on this. They just they think that we just hate gay people and we don't want them to be happy. And when really what we're saying is this isn't an, a normative statement, it's a positive statement that uh, this is not what marriage is. How do you respond to the accusations of, of hatred and bigotry. You know, for, for, it seems to me that it's, it's similar to saying, I like uh, apples, but I won't call an apple an orange, this question of gay marriage. Right. And they say, well, why do you hate oranges? And I don't hate, I like oranges very much. I want oranges to thrive. I like orange juice. I'm probably screwing up the metaphor somewhere here, but I don't hate oranges. I just think that apples are not oranges. H- how do you respond to those uh, accusations of hatred? Yeah, I would say at least two things. Uh, w- one is, uh, I remember uh, there was someone very, very close to me who, when he came out of the came out to me. Um, he uh, he wanted me to watch a video, and, and uh, so I watched this you know, kind of a documentary. It was a um, made by a man who had a relationship with another man, and uh, it just ends tragically where the other man dies. Uh, it's a true story, and um, he said, "I want you to watch this because one guy said when I came out to my parents and introduced him to." Shane was the man's name. Um, my, my nieces and nephews called him Uncle Shane, and my whole family loved him, and it was it was great. But then when Shane told his family about me, they said, if you two ever show up on our front door, you'll be met at the door with a shotgun. And I remember him showing me this this video, and uh, like I'm thinking, like, what, what, what does he want? Like, you know, so the hmm. video ends, and he says, so what do you think? And I said, uh, are those my only two choices? Like, be, because right. that sense of, like, is it is it? Is it I'm going to have to embrace and agree and celebrate everything you choose or, or I you? hate you? Yeah. So yeah, because like cause that, I don't like either of those. And, and it was funny because um, I, I, I probably am not closer to another human being on this planet than I am to him. Because I love him very, very much. Um, his dad even said something interesting. His dad said, uh, no good parent agrees with every decision their child makes. Because that's not a real relationship. He said some parents do, but no good parent does. <laughs> That's, right. because that's, isn't, that's, that's not a real relationship, is it, where I can't disagree with you and mm-hmm. you can't disagree with me um, because I have to just always celebrate every choice you make. No, I don't maintain that anyone would choose 
to you know feel transgender or to choose to experience same-sex attraction. And so I'm not saying that. I'm saying choose to act on something. Mm-hmm. And I think that when it comes to being you know accused of being haters, uh, the the church or, or Christians or whoever I need to be really really clear about like no 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 we love this person. It's actually so this 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 man. Back in 2012, we had a, a gay marriage debate in Minnesota. And so all these lawn, lawn signs all over the place. And so there was, you know, redefine marriage and some keep the marriage defined well. And I remember uh, this man had come over with his uh, his partner at the time uh, to the house. And and everyone in the house just absolutely loved the two of them because they're great guys. And we just, of course, I mean, w- w- you know what we believe, you know, when we know what you believe. Uh, but we're going to love you. And it was so interesting because as they drove away, they saw the lawn, the yard sign. And one said to the other, said, wait a second, I'm just so confused. Why? Because they they loved us. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. But they have this sign. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it was this cognitive disconnect of, of course. wait, you can disagree with me and still love me? Absolutely right. is the case. And, and this... And, and, I think the popular press and uh, the mainstream media and lefties, the secular left, they don't understand when Pope Francis set calls gay marriage, the, the lobby for redefining marriage and redefining gender and sexuality, calls that a machination of the devil, but uh, simultaneously says, who am I to judge? I have plenty of my own sins, <laughs> my own sins of the flesh. And even, you know, Dante puts sins of the flesh much higher up than sins yeah. of de- deception Barbara. or whatever. The, in, in terms of yeah. levels of hell, the adulterers and sins of the flesh, they're kind of swirling around in the, in the upper echelons, you know. It's really the, the uh, betrayers who are way, way down lower. Yeah, it can get far worse. And that second piece of like, you know, when, it, when you say, um, why, does, why is this not, how is this not hate? I remember uh, talking with someone and using, using the example of um, baseball and football. So, uh, you know, baseball, there's, there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to baseball. Um, you can have, you know, the, the bases 90 feet apart like normal. You can have, you know, an ump. You can not have no ump. You can you know, do it yourself. You can have uh, the bases actually being those canvas things stuff with whatever. Or you can have, you know, first base is someone's mitt. Second base is someone's T-shirt. You know, third base is, you know, a hat. And there's some flexibility. But to play baseball, you need at least three essential elements. You need a baseball, a baseball bat, and you need to try to hit the ball with the bat to score a run. And so but those are the essential things. You maybe take away the baseball and replace it with a softball. You have a different game. It's called softball. Or you're uh, you replace it with football. Or, you know. you, yeah. You, you take away the, the bat, and now you have catch. You're playing catch. You take away uh, the trying to hit the ball with the bat to run around the bases to score a run, and you're just having batting practice or fielding practice. But to play baseball, you need those three essential things. So it's not um, limitlessly undefined. You know, it, right. it has some, some essential now, here comes a football player and says, hey, I want to play baseball. I'm like, great. You, uh, you're up next. And he says, no, no, but, but I, I want to keep playing football, but I want you to call it baseball. And he's like, well, we can't do that. Well, yes, you can because, you know, you guys don't have an ump or, you know, we have an ump. Or you, you play on a, on a field. We play on a field. You have teams. We have teams. It's the same game. I say, okay, but you don't have the essential elements. And I'm not even going to get to the point of, like, complaining about football and saying it's not as good as baseball. Right. I'm just saying they're different mm-hmm. things. And unless we can define a thing, to say it's different in some people's minds means you're saying it's bad. Mm-hmm. And they're like, wait a second, but I'm, I'm just, let's just start with saying these are different things. That's a great point. So to say a marriage and a, a monogamous same-sex relationship, I don't even have to say one is bad. I can just say they're different. That's right. And let's leave it at that. Inherent in that, there is n- uh, make, without making any moral statement whatsoever, right. you're making simply a categorical statement on the nature of two things. That is a great point. Now, much more important than any of these things, this has been an excellent discussion, pretty illuminating, uh, e- even for me, and I've f- just finished reading your book, which I enjoyed very much, much more important than any of these things. Father, Democrats have become very extreme on abortion. They now insist on killing pain-capable late-term babies. Next up will be fourth and fifth trimester abortion. They support redefining marriage into nothing. Next up will be polygamy and sologamy. That's the new thing where you marry yourself. More on that on another episode, but it seems pretty rough. I think it's from Sex and the City, as are many terrible things in our culture. Uh, According to Pew Research, while all the votes were relatively close, Catholic voters in America picked uh, Al Gore over George Bush, Obama over McCain, Obama over Romney in 2000, 2008, and 2012. A large number of Catholics also supported John Kerry and even Hillary Clinton. 
Why do Catholics vote for Democrats? I, I think it goes back to um, this kind of sleight of hand. And the sleight of hand it has to do with uh, Catholic social teaching is a real, really important thing. And it's a real thing. Real thing is a really important thing. Catholic social, teach, social teaching. And so when you were raised Catholic, you, you hear like, okay, care for the poor. Care for those who are marginalized. Care for those who are weak and those that the world does, wa- wants to forget about. And you're told this. And it's, it's true. And then comes along a, a political party that says, hey, we care for the weak. We care for the marginalized. We care for the poor. We care for those who are bullied. We care for all these kinds of things. And I think there's kind of a, a bait and switch kind of thing happening where Catholics say, well, yeah, that's what that's what I've been like. I, my, my conscience has at least been formed in that way. And so, well, I know that they support abortion all the way to the end. I mean, even like, you know, partial birth abortion that mm-hmm. people would vote for this craziness. They're good. It's going to become that, fourth that, trimester abortion. That's going to be the next thing. I'm positive it. of it. And then, but so they say, well, yeah, that, but, but, but what about all those people that they're helping with helping refugees and they're helping this and this and this. And I think, I, I just think it's a lack of, um, lack of good formation and the lack of, and I would even say not only formation, I would say it's lack of courage. Mm. Um, that's, that's absolutely true because when it comes down to it, I think that, uh, as a, as a church, a lot of Catholics have become really, really comfortable and we're comfortable with status quo. And so, you know, I got a call the other day from a, a youth group leader who was saying that, um, there's some y- young people in her, in her school who they were in South Dakota in, uh, Sturgis, South Dakota. There's a group of transgender high school students in this high school. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And, and she said, yeah, our youth group kids, you know, we're trying to be nice to them, but they were just really mean back to them. And, and I said, what do you mean really mean? I said, well, they gave them dirty looks when they said hello in the hallway. I thought, okay, well, let's pump the brakes. That's not being really mean. That's a ubiquitous <laughs> sort of thing that happens in high schools. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, and so I was like, well, you know, I understand what's going on, but, but we need to actually prepare um, the people, prepare the people and prepare, prepare ourselves for like, it's okay if people don't like you. Jesus actually even said, people are going to hate you. For my um, sake, for my be, sake. For my sake. And then that sense of like being able to say, let's, I, I'm going to use a, uh, grow a pair. I was going to say, I don't know if we can say that on air. I don't <laughs> no, know that, on this show, that. anything goes. That's, that's some I of the most polite thing you can say on my show. <laughs> I'm in a pair of eyeballs and really see the truth. That's what I meant to say. Um, <laughs> I, I, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but please finish the point. No, but, but that, I think what, what needs is a formation and courage. And I think that's one of uh, the two areas that we're really lacking as, as a Catholic church is formation and really uh, giving us uh, encouragement to be courageous. I love that point so much. I, I, that, I think that's how I've got to sign off my show from now on. As Father Michael Schmitz tells us all, grow a pair of eyes to see the truth. <laughs> Father Michael Schmitz, author of Made for Love, Same Sex Attractions, and the Catholic Church. And you can catch him on YouTube. Father Schmitz, thank you so much for being here. I've really enjoyed it. And for everybody else, this, that's our show. That's our whole show today. Come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, by the way, is our one hundredth episode. You don't want to miss that. We have some, we have some fun things planned. We've got crazy new technology that is going to shape our show tomorrow, but you'll have to tune in to see it. That is it. I am Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles show. Tune in tomorrow. We'll do it all again. The Michael Knowles show is produced by Marshall Benson, executive producer, Jeremy Boring, senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.